Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about nuclear energy, nuclear weapons, nuclear waste, nuclear waste weapons, and other genius ideas thought up by our mentally challenged species. Our guest, Linda Pence Gunter, is founder and international specialist at Beyond Nuclear. You can go to beyondnuclear.org and also beyondnuclearinternational.org. Linda Pence Gunter, welcome back to Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. It's great to be back. Thanks for coming on. So maybe we should start with uh, what I think is some good news out of Germany. What has Germany just done? Germany has just gone nuclear free in, the, in shutting down the last of its three reactors. They were actually supposed to close in December. That was always the plan. Germany is still on track to a carbon neutral economy by 2045. There was a little bit of a delay in the shutdown because there was political pressure put on them to keep the reactors going because of the cutoff of supply of gas from Russia because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But of course, nuclear power only supplies electricity and gas fires up the heat in Germany. So it wasn't really there uh, as much of a standby and they always plan to close them on April 15th and that's what they did. Um, absolutely wonderful. Uh, why and how are they able to do that and so many other places not able to do that? Well, it goes back a ways because there's a long history, I think, in Germany of opposition to nuclear power, helped not in the least, but in, in greatly helped, sadly, by being doused with a fallout from the Chernobyl disaster in 1986. So Germans experience firsthand what it's like to live in the aftermath of a nuclear power accident. You couldn't play outside in the rain if you were children, couldn't eat fresh produce and so forth. And in fact, even today, there are mushrooms and wild boar in parts of Germany that are too radioactive to eat because of this. So there was a huge amount of awareness about the risks of nuclear power. But in 2000, the then a red green coalition of social Democrats and Green Party introduced the Renewable Energy Act, which uh, had a precondition that if we were to phase out nuclear, it had to be replaced by renewable energy and not by fossil fuels. So that was a guarantee within the Renewable Energy Act, which also provided something called a feed-in tariff, which meant that you had a guaranteed price for your renewable energy when you put it on the grid. And they also had grid priorities. So renewable energy went on first, and if there was still need, other sources would follow. So this was a very a big confidence builder for investors in nuclear energy and in renewable energy. So clearly, that launched it uh, in a big way, and it's been on a more or less direct path ever since. There were some uh, brief uh, relapses under the Merkel government when she renew, uh, re removed some of those incentives. So there was a little bit of a dip in renewable expansion for a while, but they're fully back committed to uh, achieving their 100% renewable energy economy now. So this, so this abandoning of nuclear energy in Germany has more to do with shifting to renewables than with the United States blowing up a pipeline and wanting to sell its own so-called natural gas to Germany. Renewable energy revolution in Germany and the phase out of nuclear power has been going on for several decades. And this is not a new thing. Uh, it accelerated uh, after the Fukushima disaster in 2011, Japan, when then Chancellor Angela Merkel, who's a physicist, had an epiphany overnight, more or less, and, and put the nuclear phase out back on track, which she had actually halted under her government, put it back on track. So there was also a huge amount of political will for this because renewable energy, uh, not only was it viewed obviously as beneficial and safer, but also as a, as a profitable business, which stimulated all sorts of other chains, you know, within the not just sort of renewable energy itself, but the steel industry, the ceramics industry, the ports were all revitalized by uh, implementing a renewable energy policy. So it was in fact politically expedient too, because all political parties in Germany at one point were anti-nuclear. That's sort of a fantasy that we can only imagine in this country. You know, So it was also a political winning ticket to oppose nuclear power. So that's that's really, but I think, the anti-nuclear movement has to take a lot of credit as well for, for keeping up the pressure and really making sure that the message you know, stayed on track all this time. So there's 
definitely cause for celebration with them, for sure. So three cheers for them. Uh, Linda Pence Gunter, there are a lot of people pushing the idea that renewable energy is nice and kind of cute, uh, but small and not of the potential to solve our climate collapse problem. Uh, nuclear energy is the answer, much as we might not like it and it's slightly flawed and the waste will kill people millennia from now, it, it, it's the answer. It's the only possible serious rational choice. What, what do you say to this argument? Well, you said something at the top of the show about our rather sort of compromised species, you know, and this <laughs> seems to exemplify that, you know, that it's sort of a collective madness, really, to, to embrace the most expensive, slowest, and most dangerous way to make electricity at a time when we are in a climate crisis, you know, this climate change is not something that's coming along at some point, we're in it, right? So we all agree that we have an emergency, we have one job to do as a species, and that's to resolve this, because otherwise we're not gonna be here. So to choose the energy source that will take the longest, that will steal money away from the available technologies that we have already, i.e. renewable energy and energy efficiency, and therefore delay a swift transition to a fully carbon neutral economy it seems like a sort of collective madness. And I, it's hard to explain other than two things, I think. One is the incredible power of the lobby of the nuclear industry, which we're seeing played out now with all this propaganda, which is saturating every media market. And the other is the connection to nuclear weapons which is you know, in black and white. And there's a desperate insistence from the nuclear weapons sector to keep the civil nuclear power sector going because they rely on it for personnel, know-how, technology, and so forth. And, and that's all written down in places like the Atlantic Council. So uh, I think those are the two sort of quiet explanations, but everybody else just jumps on board and repeats this nonsense rhetoric. You know, that it's safe, it's clean, it's this, it's that, you know, none of which is true, none of which stands up to any kind of scrutiny when you look at empirical data. You know, renewable energy clearly can deliver more carbon reductions faster for less money than any other technology we have so far. So therefore, why would you not choose it in a climate emergency? Isn't, uh, I wanted to ask you about this, isn't nuclear weaponry uh, a, a, an underreported significant driver of nuclear energy, not just in terms of generating propaganda in stink tanks and so forth, but also nations acquiring nuclear energy in order to be closer to having nuclear weaponry. Yes, well, there's a, that terrible clause in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, Article 4, which gives countries the inalienable right to develop what they call safe, peaceful, neither of which are true, nuclear energy in exchange for renouncing ever developing nuclear weapons, which is sort of shooting yourself in the foot really in terms of trying to get a nuclear abolition done. Unfortunately, this same clause was lifted verbatim and put into the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. I think a lot of people haven't sort of spotted that necessarily, but it's there and it was, it was put there as a condition of getting that treaty signed and ratified. But what it means, as you point out, is that if you continue to leave what I call it, so the drawbridge down to the castle or the Trojan horse, you know, whatever metaphor you want to use, if if you continue to leave the opportunity, the materials, the know-how, the technology there, you'll always be able to transition from a nuclear power program to a nuclear weapons program. And it explains why countries like Saudi Arabia, you know, United Arab Emirates, Iran, why would they want nuclear power? You know, if you're Saudi Arabia and you need to replace the oil that you'd rather export, which we would rather they didn't, obviously, because they shouldn't do any more oil, but they want this to replace that so they don't burn so much oil themselves. You know, if you're Saudi Arabia, wouldn't you choose wind and solar? If, you, if it's electricity you need, wouldn't you choose wind and solar over expensive, slow, dangerous nuclear power? There's only one reason that a country like Saudi Arabia wants a nuclear power program. And that's have the capacity at some point, if they so choose, to transition to nuclear weapons development. So the door remains open. The two things are married together. And we have to, in order to achieve a nuclear weapons free world, 
abolish both of those technologies. And that's something our organizations pushed a lot with the nuclear weapons, anti-nuclear weapons groups, like, you know, bring us on board because we all need to be talking about all of these things. We're speaking with Linda Pence Gunter, and the group is Beyond Nuclear. You can go to beyondnuclear.org. What about the arguments that the pro-nuke people make that renewable energy has uh, deficiencies? It's not as sustainable as advertised. It does huge damage. It has a problem with storage. You can make it, but you can't store it or or transmit it. Uh, it's It costs too much. It's too slow, et, et cetera. Well, it certainly doesn't cost, cost too much and it's not too slow. I mean, I, you can't stand those arguments up at all, I don't think. This issue of, of battery storage and so forth is making so many strides so quickly that we've overcome so many of those challenges and are continuing to overcome them. And I think it's all about political will. It's not the technology that's the problem. It's the political will that's the problem. And again, as I said before, you can stifle renewable development if you take the funding that you have available to stimulate it and put it into some sort of black hole like nuclear energy, especially if you're talking about new nuclear reactors. I mean, you know, the lead time to bring on a new nuclear power plant is so incredibly long. And you just have to look at the two that are still under construction, one of which fired up recently and then had to shut down in Georgia at the plant Vogel three and four reactors. These reactors have taken 16 years from the moment they were conceived to get here. Only one of them fired up and then had to shut down because it immediately had technical problems. And it's cost $34 billion so far for these two reactors, $20 billion more than the original estimated cost. So, and that's with a known technology, right? These are the current designs of light water reactors with which we're familiar, 1,000 megawatts or so. Then we were talking about new reactors, new designs, which are all on paper. And so the, you know, the learning in the nuclear sector is negative, right? It's negative learning. Things have got slower, they've got more expensive, they're having more problems. You introduce an unknown design that you haven't tried out yet, you haven't even built and say, this is the answer to climate change. We don't have 12 years you know, to bring one overpriced reactor on to do what? You know, in that time with $34 billion, imagine what you could have done in the renewable sector instead. And, and what does it increase in terms of risks to have uh, idiot members of our species killing each other in large numbers in a part of the world with nuclear power plants in it? I'm talking about Ukraine, uh, a, a part of the world where they've had a disaster already with a nuclear power plant. What? Uh, how is a war different when it's being fought in and about major nuclear power plants? Well, what I always say about this, and there are 15 reactors that could be operational in Ukraine. They're not all operating right now, but there are four sites, 60, uh, 15 reactors. The Chernobyl site, as you described, which is not out of danger, it still has a huge amount of radioactive waste sitting at that site. And so what this, what I feel is, what I always say, first of all, is a nuclear disaster, which can happen because of loss of power or human error, can happen anytime, any place, anywhere to any nuclear power plant, right? So that's a perpetual danger. Having a war raging around them just exacerbates that risk and adds one more component, which is what if those reactors in Ukraine were accidentally attacked, hit by missiles or bombs, or deliberately uh, attacked? And when we look at the Zaporizhia site, which is the six reactor site in the southeast, which is actually kind of embroiled in the fighting, the closest, and has been occupied by Russian troops since March 4th, all of those factors sort of conspire. If the grid goes down because of a bombardment and the power is lost to that plant, it's and that's happened a few times already, they have to go to back up diesel generators. If there's a war raging around a nuclear site and you have to deliver you know, supplies of diesel fuel once those generators run out and you can't do it, then there's no power. You're looking at fires, explosions, meltdowns. The workers there working under duress and under occupation, many of whom have left, so it's a depleted team, tired, frightened, fleeing. That's not an ideal situation to avoid human error, right? And then, of course, you layer on what happens if a bomb lands on or a missile lands or sh the shelling you know, explode something critical there. Uh, so it's just a really nerve wracking situation and would be, 
infinitely worse potentially than Chernobyl because these reactors have been going much longer and so they have much bigger radioactive inventories there. So what could get out if the worst happened would be a huge amount more than got out even for the devastating Chernobyl accident that we saw in 86. Can can you explain why it's worse if a reactor has been running longer? And and you mentioned the waste. Who's figured out the solution for what you do with nuclear waste? Well, the answer to your second part is nobody yet. But the first part of the question is that obviously when you look at 1986 and Chernobyl Unit 4, it had been going for about two years. So the amount of fuel that was in the reactor and the amount of fuel that had come out of the reactor, you know, after about 18 months, normally you remove the fuel rods, they call them spent, it means they're sort of done. And you put them in a pool to cool thermally for about, and radioactively for about five years. And after that, you can offload them into usually casks, which sit on the site. In the US, you know, all the radioactive waste at nuclear power plants in the US is stored at the moment on site because we haven't come up with a, a, a satisfactory uh, solution as to what to do with it. So at Zaporizhia, because there are six reactors there, not four, um, and because they've all been going since the late 70s, mid 80s, uh, the amount of waste that's accumulated at that site is infinitely more than that was at Chernobyl in 1986. So that's part of the reason that the risks are so much higher. Um, if you look at Fukushima, you know, the disaster that happened in 2011 in Fukushima, Japan, and the fears about those fuel pool fires and what would happen if they caught fire and released their entire radioactive inventory, um, prompted then president of Japan, Naoto Kan, to insist that the TEPCO, that TEPCO, the company that owned the plants, kept a, a workforce on that site to try to prevent the worst, because if they had evacuated the workforce and abandoned those reactors and those fuel pools had ignited and released their entire inventory, they'd have had to evacuate Tokyo. <laughs> you know, that was kind of an impossible nightmare. And it prompted Khan, in fact, to say that Japan as a country would have been finished if that happened. And so that's the scale just for those reactors there. So what could happen at Zaporizhia is enormously frightening, really, in terms of the potential. And the International Atomic Energy Agency, which unfortunately is in the business of promoting the continued use of nuclear power, nevertheless, did make some trips to Zaporizhia to see if they could set up what they call a safe zone around the plants, so a no fighting here zone, which most people thought was completely impracticable and has turned out to be the case. And they've abandoned even attempting this now. There's just no no interest from either side, apparently, to establish something like this, unless certain concessions were given, which no one will give. Well, I should note that World Beyond War, where I work, has a team of people over there right now still not giving up on trying to figure out how to do unarmed protection of that site, uh, but it's not easy. Um, uh, it should be. It should be a priority. Um, it, it, when I talk with supporters of nuclear energy, they tell me there have only been three or four big disasters over all these years. You should be ooing and eyeing over how few the disasters are, have been and how the technology has been improved so they won't repeat. But I can, But if you can compare this with renewable energies, the, there isn't even the possibility of similar disasters, right? So uh, I, well, I mean, first of all, you, they haven't improved the technology. Um, and so therefore, it can still happen again. But the second thing I find really kind of, uh, sort of distasteful, almost and immoral about that argument that they make is that it dismisses the hundreds and thousands of people who've been seriously harmed or killed by the major nuclear accidents that we have had. And it also ignores the countless people along the entire nuclear fuel chain who've suffered. So it's not just about the big showdown, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, Fukushima, you know, yes, okay, that's the, the worst case scenario at the reactor generation end. But in order to have those plants in the first place, you have to mine uranium. And when you look at the conditions under which that's happened, whether in the US or Niger in France or Australia, you're talking about mostly Aboriginal or indigenous people, First Nations people who've worked in horrendous conditions, have taken all the negative health impacts 
you know, have been left with a detritus of uranium mining. So there's a continued exposure to the radioactive waste that's been left behind and completely neglected pretty much and not mentioned in the story at all. So you've got to factor in, if you factor in everybody that's been harmed by the nuclear fuel chain from the beginning through generation disasters and waste mismanagement, that's an enormous amount of people whose lives have been either ended or permanently damaged, whose health has been damaged, whose opportunity to have children has been lost. That, that should not be dismissed as, oh, well, you know, we've only had a few. But in fact, that's exactly, I saw Bill Gates do exactly that on a, a Wall Street Journal sort of chit chat show where he sort of laughed it off like, oh, well, you know, apart from that, we've had a pretty good century. I thought, you know, right. that is so disrespectful to all those countless millions of people who've been harmed by this technology and whose lives have been ruined. Apart from that, how'd you like the play, Mrs. Lincoln? It, it, it's a little out of proportion. Uh, and if you add in weapons testing uh, and the use of depleted uranium testing, I mean, we, uh, we don't have that long left. I, I wanna ask you about depleted uranium because this is something that's done with the waste. And this is something the United Kingdom is sending to Ukraine. What is, what is the, the evidence in terms of the harm done by depleted uranium? And, and what is it for people who don't know? Well, deplete, depleted uranium U-238 is a byproduct of making fuel for the nuclear power and nuclear weapons sector. And I have to say, I've come to this aspect of this whole story fairly recently in, in writing the most recent article on Beyond Nuclear International about it. And it turned out to be an incredibly complex and difficult issue because these are armor piercing bullets essentially that can be fired from tanks that can penetrate tanks. And so were popular in the Gulf War and also in the Balkans. And uh, there's been a lot of anecdotal and also medical studies done on the ground looking at the outcomes, the health outcomes, not only for the troops who are involved in using these weapons, but also on civilians living in these areas where they were used. And what you're seeing is a lot of birth defects, a lot of cancers, things, medical outcomes, high rates of medical outcomes that suggest a connection. The difficulty, of course, is making that connection definitively. The burden of proof is always on the victims. The precautionary principles not in place. Uh, the DU weapons are um, they do have uranium, but they are it's a heavy metal component mostly that is the toxic element of this. So it's complicated in the sense of whether or not you call them a nuclear weapon uh, even. But the fact is that when you look at sort of international humanitarian or human rights laws, uh, using weapons that can cause this kind of harm is generally looked upon as something that should be outlawed. So clearly, if there is this much doubt about the harm they can do as a legacy to human health, they should be banned. And so the collective community that I work in all feels very strongly that they should be banned. We can argue the ins and outs of exactly what component of these weapons causes what harm, but the fact is that harm apart from the fact that war isn't a good idea either. If we are in a war, this is not a component we need to add to it. Well, I think many governments, uh, nations of the world have tried for years to ban these weapons. And if you had a democratic United Nations, they probably would have been. Um, uh, speaking of immoral comments, I saw the spokesperson for the Pentagon asked about this, uh, sending depleted uranium weapons to Ukraine in particular, and his response was, well, if Vladimir Putin is worried about his tanks and his troops, he should just take them home. Uh, but the damage, as you just described, is to the people who live in the area primarily, right? Not just the, the combatants in the war, right? Right. But because there have been some studies that couldn't ascribe the negative health impacts that they're seeing to the use of DU, the, the Pentagon and the UK Department of Defense will always come out and say, there's no evidence to support that this does harm. And that's what they're gonna stick to, you know, and because we don't have the precautionary principle in place. And so that's, you know, that's not how we operate, obviously. And it's not how we operate with nuclear power plants either. When you see raised rates of leukemia amongst children living around operating nuclear power plants, you know, the burden of proof is always on the medical community to show that it's the nuclear plant that caused it, even though it's kind of obvious if you're any kind of detective, <laughs> that if there's suddenly raised rates of leukemia around nuclear power plants, it's probably that. So that that industry should have to prove it's not them. You know, that's the way around it ought to be.
Yes. So when they declare that Three Mile Island had zero casualties, uh, what's the truth there? That's a lie. I mean, that you know, that's the Jules Pfeiffer cartoon of the Three Mile Island. They lie, it says, you know, it's a famous cartoon. And, and that's absolutely right. I mean, if you don't look, you won't find them. But there was a very good epidemiological study done by Dr. Stephen Wing out of the University of North Carolina that showed clearly that the exposure to what came out of Three Mile Island, and they had to close the monitors because they went off the scale. So we don't know exactly what came out, but clearly there was plenty of radiation that got out. There's plenty of stories to show that people were harmed by that. Yeah, we, we've got just a few minutes left. I've been seeing these headlines about Germany becoming nuclear free. And I've been thinking, but there are U.S. nuclear weapons in Germany and at least five other countries that we know of, uh, arguably illegally under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. If Germany can find the will and the political ability to get rid of nuclear energy, can it do the same with nuclear weapons? That sounds like a fine new challenge for the German anti-nuclear community to get on board with and, and probably are already on board with, I imagine, because it seems to me that there's a lot of integration in Germany between the movements that promote renewable energy and those that oppose nuclear power, and nuclear weapons. So I, I understand that that's you know, quite a strong campaign already. And in fact, you're right. When I wrote about Germany, I thought, should I say it's nuclear free or should I say it's nuclear power free? It's not their weapons. They're not their weapons. So they could say we don't have nuclear weapons, but yeah. they have nuclear weapons on their territory. How do, how, how do they do that? And how can the rest of the world integrate as, as you're working on those who have concerns about nuclear energy with those who have concerns about uh, destroying all life on the planet more quickly with nuclear weapons? Well, we've all got to work together and that's what I've been doing. I've been going to conferences like with the ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. I've been working with international physicians for the prevention of nuclear war, actually who have pushed me to do this, to talk constantly about the connections, you know, that we, we have to embrace both these fights together. We need not to be siloed like this. And it's a challenge because in fact, in the anti-nuclear weapons movement, as you probably know, there is some resistance to taking on the anti-nuclear power component as well and some people still wonder whether nuclear power isn't perhaps useful and so it's it's we've got work to do but i think together we're stronger for sure well i work more in the anti-weapons so i will nudge them toward the anti-energy <laughs> and whoever's working on nuclear energy should uh, focus a little more on on weapons um linda pence gunter how can people keep track uh, of your work and get in touch with you support what you're doing well, thank you. Yes. So our organizational website is beyondnuclear.org. And then we have a news website called Beyond Nuclear International. So that's at beyondnuclearinternational.org. And that's where you'll find the longer form articles. And also we have things called talking points on there, which are very useful kind of cheat sheets that give you the, the nuggets of all the essential messages pulled from all the longer reports that everybody doesn't have time to read. I can be reached at Linda at beyondnuclear.org. You'll find all our contact information on our website. And we're happy to hear from people, send you materials and um, do shows like this anytime to try to get the word out farther and wider. Wonderful. And thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you for having me. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.